Okay, I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Jonathan Taylor. Uh, this is Moose in Production, a two year retrospective. I uh, work for EIG and the HostGator brand. That's my email. Uh, write it down quick because I got a lot of slides to do. Here's what the talk's about uh, uh, it's uh, about moose patterns and people. Uh, didn't get my diagram quite right, but I do wish I had made that a heart because I like those things. So why the long name if that's what it's about? Uh, because these things mean specific things to me. One, of course, we use moose. Uh, second, production has a very specific meaning to us. That means it's software that we actually use for the enterprise and uh, is released. So this, is, you know, this isn't code that was uh, uh, an exercise. This is stuff we really made. Um, two years of experience using Moose, so that's kind of obvious. And uh, the retrospective part is to make it clear that um, I'm talking about uh, our story. So this is not a, um, you know, a list of things you should do or what's best or worst. Uh, this is about what happened to us and what worked for us. And if it's useful to you, uh, I'll be very, very glad. Because a lot of times there's a lot of uh, uh, debate about uh, the different Tim Toadies. So this is one of the ways uh, that we tried to do it and some of the things that happened when we tried to do it that way. So where we started was that uh, we had uh, uh, a uh, whole lot of different uh, Perl systems doing a whole lot of different jobs. Uh, this happened to be our billing system. Now, even though it looked ugly like this, it ha turns out that the business ran pretty well for like a decade on the system like this. So even though it wasn't pretty, it did the job and the business got quite successful. Uh, the thing happened though is we got acquired by EIG, us being HostGator, and they had some uh, reporting requirements that uh, this model wasn't up for. Because the different pieces, Cron 1 and Cron 2, they might have both done the billing. Actually, let's use Cron 3 and Cron 2. They both did billing, they both served the purpose well, they did it good enough, but they did it ever so slightly different from a reporting standpoint. And uh, we had a you know, necessity to try to make the reporting consistent. Uh, in order to do that, we wanted to move from what we had to something that looked more like this, so that we had a uh, centralized place where we uh, did all of the different billing logic instead of having it uh, spread all over the place. And that way, if we do it the same way all over, we can report on it consistently. Pretty clear? All right. So once we decided to do this, we had to decide uh, what technologies we wanted to use to do it. We decided we didn't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about how to do OO, but we definitely wanted to do OO, and we didn't want to do a lot of time evaluating what we did and we didn't need, so we chose pretty much what we at the time perceived to have everything we could possibly need, and that ended up being loose. Uh, the data, data table, the table data gateways, that ended up being DBIC, but, or DBIC, I'm not sure what uh, the, well, the way to do that is, uh, but uh, I say it anyway. Uh, but uh, the domain models we uh, built in Moose. Um, so, where's my, ah, I skipped over it. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, uh, these are, some, um, are, when I say patterns, some of them are more um, formal patterns, some of them are patterns in people, that's the people part of the equation. And these are some of the behaviors that came out of it. Um, these are a little bit vague because, uh, you know, I don't want you to just read my slides, I want to be able to talk about them. Um, but this is a uh, uh, kind of an overview. Uh, a lot of this is talking about laziness and the laziness in the context of what we were doing. Uh, I have a little bit of editorial on why we had some of the trouble with uh, the laziness. Uh, then we talk a little about a, a coercion. That's the offer you can refuse. Uh, a little bit of a uh, note on testing, the end. And if I did this too quickly, then I have some extra stuff we can look at. Uh, and if I have uh, way too much, then uh, we'll uh, hurry up real quick at the end. So the first behavior we kind of came into contact with when we started using Moose uh, was something I call method aversion. And there were so many nifty features that Moose would do, and the first thing that smacks you in the face with Moose is attributes. And now somebody, something happened where the uh, 
part of the brain that thinks about methods kind of went a little bit weird for a while. So this is a, uh, uh, an attribute that uh, uh, is lazy, so it doesn't do any work it doesn't need to do. And uh, if it needs to uh, get the total of the bottles, it uh, goes ahead and calls the lazy builder. And that solves the problem, right? All right, no reaction. Well, the answer is kind of, sort of. Uh, the problem with this is that if something changes, uh, say the number of sodas, and this has been built, and you try to go get the total bottles, it, the information will be wrong. So if what you really want to do is know the total, what you really want is that. So somehow the fact that attributes were available suddenly made this seem like a bad idea because it's inefficient because you calculate it every time. So it added complexity. And again, this might, be, this might be obvious to other people that it's a bad idea, but this is something that really happened in our code. So the next uh, phenomenon uh, that I'd like to talk about is the uh, suicidal builder. Uh, this is also about laziness because we were all about laziness. We wanted to not do anything we didn't have to. And in this case, we've got cabbages, and uh, it's a, an attribute again, and it's lazy, and it's got a builder. Now, uh, it turned out, though, that, you know, uh, you know this is arbitrary because it's an example, but if, uh, you know, if you don't have cabbages and coffee, you don't have mm -mm good. And so if there's no coffee and you try to use the builder, uh, the, the builder would die. So... You're running your code and suddenly you have a, uh, an instance of your class and you want to try to go call your uh, cabbages uh, attribute and your code explodes. And then you have to go dig through and discover that there's a, an, a, a necessity for uh, coffee. Very difficult to debug, but this kind of thing also happened because, you know, we wanted to enforce the fact that you have to have this particular state in the object to um, uh, properly get a cabbages. So if uh, you try to use it, there's the, when I was talking about it, mysteriously dying. Uh, so this is idiomatic moose. You know, when you call a moose attribute, you don't generally expect your code to explode. But using the previous code, it just might do that to you. So one of our uh, observant developers might go, oh, that, that could explode, so then they do this. Now, problem solved, right? Okay, let's, let, okay, um, how about that? So there, now, now it's maybe undef. So, um, you know, uh, what happened was is that I felt like we really needed to go and think about some fundamentals, right? Again, uh, if afterward you want to argue about this stuff, uh, I'll do my best to uh, avoid argument. I don't like conflict very much, but I'll discuss it with you. But in the way we used it, um, when you use Moose, you're defining a class. Um, the fact that it has cabbages means, in our case, that your uh, class is composed of an instances of cabbages, Lazy one means that uh, lazy one means that uh, we have the ability to uh, get an instance of cabbages if we need to, and uh, the builder get cabbages uh, is supposed to have the job of getting you a cabbage. It's not supposed to have the job of checking whether or not you have coffee, and uh, that was pretty much the the real problem is that the um, enforcing of whether or not coffee is there. Uh, really should be the concern of something else. In our case, it should have been the concern of the constructor. You shouldn't have an object that could explode because it's not properly formed. So now I'm going to go on to uh, uh, a, a lazy loader pattern, which is sort of a, an interesting uh, 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 sort of counterpoint to the example I gave. Fast. So here's a, um, 
uh, an interesting counterpoint. There's a, a pattern called uh, lazy loader. And lazy loader is that um, if you have something that's very expensive, like say a database call, uh, you don't want to actually do that call unless uh, you really have to, because it might be expensive. It might be a million line query. So if you have an invoice and it's got, you know, 1,500 items on it because you were very successful at selling something, you might not want to just always load up all those items if you just want to say, you know, find out some bit of trivia about the invoice. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, you do use lazy. I think it's quite appropriate. And uh, in this case, what we're being lazy about is, you know, line items, and we're saying it's probably slow. So now we have this. So it kind of looks familiar. So is that the same problem? No, it isn't. Um, the reason this isn't the same problem is because uh, the, the job of the load line items builder is to go get those line items. It is its responsibility to get those line items. The problem is, is that getting its line items involves a database operation. Um, database operations are outside of the control of the... Of the um, of the code if the database goes down. That's an externality, which means that there's a possibility that you're going to have a database error any time. And somewhere along the line, you need to handle that error. So what that extends to, at least for us, is that we consider the fact that the lazy loader might die because of a database problem as part of the interface of the lazy loader. It's, the sil it's still the same situation where you have to wrap it in a try block, but it's because it's a situation that's outside of your control. Uh, more or less, it's um, a runtime exception, and we don't currently have any sort of formal model for handling this type of exception. So instead, we just have to comment it and make sure that we wrap it properly. And uh, generally, uh, we do know what to do as programmers when the database uh, fails, and that is, is get up at 3 a.m. in the morning. <clears throat> so going back to the, uh, uh, the uh, original premise here, there's a line in here. It says, probably slow. And... Uh, in the case that we were having, it was a little slow. The problem is, is uh, even though it was a little slow, we almost always had to do it anyway. So we had the initial query for the invoice proper, and then you had the secondary query for the line items, and we almost always had to do the line items. So by doing this uh, and thinking that we were super clever by making it a lazy loader, uh, we ended up generating two queries on every time we instantiated one of these things. And uh, we could have very easily generated one query instead. So, uh, now I uh, go on my little aside as to uh, why it might be that the uh, laziness was so... Uh, I don't know, spread out in our code that we made this assumption that we wanted to make everything lazy all the time. And I was trying to figure out why all of us new Moose people were adding all of this extra complexity with lazy. And it turns out we were kind of told to. Um, I'm not going to follow these links, but uh, and I'll let you read the uh, uh, text if you'd like. Um, and here's the thing. Uh, uh, much like Obi-Wan says, this is true from a certain point of view. It just didn't happen to be true from our point of view. Um, what we valued uh, when we were trying to, to accomplish what we were doing was not being performant. We didn't value trying to get maximum 
uh, horsepower out of our code. Uh, we didn't value trying to limit CPU time. What we valued was uh, limiting complexity and um, uh, having very clear code and then going at uh, optimization as something that we did after we'd uh, tested the code. So it's sort of a pre-optimized versus a post-optimized uh, set of values. And there's debate back and forth between whether you should pre-optimize or not, but that's not a value we had, and the value of um, uh, you know, pre-optimization versus pre-optimization uh, was not addressed in what we originally learned with. Any questions? So, so I'm going to move on to coercion. I think coercion is really appropriately named because uh, uh, to coerce has kind of got a negative connotation to it. It's kind of forcing something to, someone to do something uh, under a little bit of duress, you know. Um, and uh, at least for us, coercion was a source of uh, quite a bit of friction. The reason that coercion was uh, part of uh, friction uh, 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 was that it was a new toy and everyone wanted to try it, for one. <clears throat> uh, two, uh, in this particular case, uh, we were going from this database model So that database right there, uh, I didn't show you much of what's in there, but uh, that's because it was uh, frightening. And um, uh, it wasn't bad in terms of doing business, but it was very bad in terms of having to program with it. Because we had a mixture of date times, Unix times, and timestamps, sometimes in the same table. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so uh, we were tasked with having to deal with dates at our domain level so that our um, classes could not have to worry about, you know, whether something not having to worry about whether something was a Unix date or you know a, a date time, and uh, so here's uh, what we came up with. Uh, because you know, again, this is oversimplified because uh, there's lots of bad uh, uh, things. It's not a separate file, so on and so forth. Uh, but this is for illustration. Uh, we wanted to, if we got a string back from the database, because that's the way our database was con con uh, configured. If you have a date in there, it'll give you back a string. Stringify date, and if you had uh, uh, a, an epoch, it would give you back an int. And uh, this seemed good at the time, but it's broken. So if we have a test for that. Pretty straightforward. You have an epic, pass it into your uh, event constructor, give it a date of epic. Let's go back and look at it there. Ah, I didn't have the uh, method there. My apologies. But it has a method called event. It's something that coerces. Um, and then you check to see if you got the right uh, uh, date time, and that's what happens. All right, so any idea why? Pretty much. A, uh, a, a fancier way, I guess, is that um, int is a subtype of num, and num is a subtype of string. So in the situation that we were in, Oh, I gave away the answer already. In the situation we were in, um, 
the uh, when the coercion code ran, it ran in this sequence. It went and checked to see if what was passed in was a um, uh, was a string, and since uh, an int, as he said, is is a string, then it used that first block of code. And this code, as it is written right here, the second coercion will never, ever, ever, ever run. So there's the fix. Put them in the other order. Now, there's a missing piece here, though. Uh, I forgot to put it in. Uh, the missing piece is that you need to put a comment in here. Because if you're maintaining the code and you're not paying attention, you might put them out of order again and break stuff. But swap the lines, now it passes. All right, well, we're talking about testing. Uh, testing is a really uh, controversial uh, topic and ha continues to be where I work. I'm not sure why, but there are different uh, 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 schools of thought. The, the schools of thought that where we all agree is that there needs to be some and there needs to be lots of it. But how we go about it uh, really is uh, wi uh, varies widely. I decided to use my rough slide here. If you can't read my handwriting, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So we had situations where we had a class and the class is a moose class. And we had a, um, a test file. And uh, you know, some people felt that for every class, you should have a test file to test the method for the class. And then if you had, say, a bug in the class, and you wanted to put in a test after you fixed it, you put in yet another test file, so on and so forth. Well, people make a big deal about Moose's startup time. For us, it was never a problem except here. <laughs> because if you had a class, and say Moose took uh, a second to start, right? Give or take, whatever. Depending on your uh, virtual environment, how fast it is or isn't. And uh, you have a class, and you've got 20 uh, tests for that class, and you've added 20 seconds to your um, time that it make, takes to make uh, to do your tests. Now we have somewhere on the order, I think of over 100 classes. So that's a, a 100 seconds times however many methods. It's pretty much O of N, where N is the number of test files that you have. So this is the one place where the startup time really affected us. And uh, the uh, the cure for this is to not make so many files. Uh, if you're going to test a class, how about you have a single file for testing the class, or you have a file for testing related classes, which is where we're moving now. Any questions? Ooh, I am running fast. That's OK. I'll improvise. So. Um, Here's the, uh, uh, where we ended up. So we actually, over the course of two years, went from from that to that. And for us, that was a really big deal, because now we can report, and uh, uh, we move all of our uh, uh, billing logic through a single library. All right, glad I put in those special features. Yes. Oh dear. We can talk about those in a minute, actually.
I'm glad you asked about that. Just a moment, I'll... Uh, I, I won't... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, we'll add that to the special features. So, I love Moose, and I'm sure that people put in a whole lot of work, and I feel really bad pointing fingers. Um, it, uh, I don't mean to sow discord, but again, I've been trying to understand. We, we did have some bizarre trigger behavior in our code. It was a symptom of method aversion. I originally didn't want to touch on it because triggers are already hard to explain, and then the examples of broken triggers in our code were um, pathologically insane almost, but I don't think intentionally so. So, uh, do I have an internet connection? I bet I don't. I forgot to connect to the internet, but I bet you I did. And I'm on. Darn it. Let's go through the other special features. And then we'll, uh, then I'll stumble my way to the thing that uh, I wanted to come back, that, I, that you asked about. Is that okay? All right. So I'm pretty, uh, pretty proud of the work that we did. And uh, uh, I didn't expect to be able to uh, force you to indulge us in this. It's a little long. But the, the reason why I emphasized in production is that while we did this, we didn't put the business on hold. We didn't stop adding features. Uh, we moved to a deploy uh, once every two weeks at minimum, on average, over the course of the past two years. And uh, we uh, deployed this to production almost the, the same three weeks that we introduced the code for consolidating our logic. And there's a neat little utility. Uh, from Google. And it's called Gorse. And it will take your repository and show you a pretty picture based on the activity on your Git repo. So we're already past the spot where we've put stuff into production, and this is all loose. So this is us um, stepping from uh, nothing to replacing all of our other uh, billing systems with uh, the new domain models. Well, if I can trick my Mac into it. Oh, darn it. Guess not. Any technical support? Hmm? I'm. I need the stuff up here. Um, yes. Getting a very weak signal. Let me see if it works well enough. Hmm. 
Let me explain to you the exciting thing happening. I'm, I'm waiting for a little thing to spin to see if I can get to medicine pan. Ha ha. You can do it. All right, now you can see. Now I can reveal the magic. Oh, very readable. Oh dear. There we go. Okay. This is in Moose Cookbook Basics. There you go. So this is a binary tree implementation um, where you instantiate a node and then if you uh, call left, it has a default of instantiating another node and it has a trigger where if you set it, it goes to the child and then sets the child's parent to self, uh, action at a distance, it has a weakened reference, so uh, that, that's how you do it. <laughs> and uh, this is one of the examples that we were looking at uh, when we were learning Moose. And uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, not my favorite implementation. Uh, partly because, uh, at least, you know, sh should that be publicly exposed? You can arbitrarily set parents and whatnot. So let me see if I have my other note. No, I don't have it. But yes, as a workaround, we'll just do a hypothetical instead. Wow, it does not like what happened to the resolution. Okay. this size all the time. So um, we have code that essentially um, oh, that's the old one. Seriously. 
a little bit back on the rails. There we go. So we also had a situation where instead of just turning this into a method, someone added a, a trigger that whenever you changed soda or water or beer, it triggered an update to the total number of bottles. So maximally lazy, uh, minimally uh, decipherable. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Do you want to see the rest of the pretty video? Only I'm going to speed it up a little further. Yeah. So that's sort of the history of the last two years compressed into uh, 3 minutes 38 seconds. And then. So. Uh, I was going to originally do my slides all by hand because I like the look of it, uh, but then I found out it was really, really hard uh, to do them. So here are some of the uh, uh, initial uh, tries I made. And here's a slide that never came to fruition. Um, Musex is really, really good, but uh, sometimes it can get out of hand and uh, when we first got our new toy, uh, you know, it, it seemed to be like we were going to try every new thing that we got. And, uh, uh, you know, this was sort of a, 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 a way of expressing that. The, uh, the reason why I didn't make it in is that uh, we, we currently have settled into a much uh, a fairly reasonable number of, of uh, justifiable MUSAX extensions. Uh, but over the life of it, it was a little bit weird to see someone arbitrarily just introduce a new dependency because they thought it was cool. <clears throat> uh, this one is about constructors. Um, when uh, uh, we first started doing Moose, uh, build arcs and build was very, uh, uh, intimidating, and uh, so we had a lot of um, stuff that looked, hey, let's go back to doing a presentation. How about that? So we had a lot of stuff, we, we had and still do have a lot of stuff in our code that instead of using a real constructor in Mooseiness, we have this get by ID, and then it will delegate to the constructor in Moose uh, to actually give you the instance. And, uh, you know, when we were first uh, learning Moose, you know, build and build args uh, were really intimidating. Uh, you know, what uh, I really feel that the right thing to do is actually to um, uh, use Moose's features to build your constructors more intelligently. So that, uh, for example, if you're creating uh, an instance of something and you already have an ID for it, uh, you very, it's very, very unlikely that it isn't meant to be gotten from the database. So why not build your constructor so that when you do a new on it, it goes to the database and constructs it that way instead of doing a get by ID constructor. Uh, for us, the reason was that it was hard. And uh, uh, I think it's the wrong thing to do now because I think new is a very obvious constructor and, um, you know, ID being already defined is a, is a pretty uh, obvious way of um, uh, telling whether or not to instantiate it. And uh, 
Okay. Ten minutes left. Wow. Any questions? Do moose again? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The um uh the you know, this is a the story of us. This is not a uh indictment of moose. It's a little bit of an indictment of the um uh documentation for moose. Um uh from an editorial standpoint, uh M moose's documentation uh, uh, designs to the features of moose, not to the design of your domain. So the examples are all about saying, how do you take a moose feature and get it to do a thing? When the problem we had was separate, the problem we had was, how do we take an idea of what our domain is like and use moose to express that? And so, uh, I think we started out going from a feature-driven model to um, uh, a domain-driven model. And as we became more comfortable with Moose, we started to understand that the examples that were provided were examples for um, demonstrating Moose and not examples on how to build things in Moose to solve your particular problems. Um, uh, and. Uh, you know, it sort of boils down to uh, kind of the basics. Um, design to interfaces. Find a way to make Moose match your interface. Any other questions? Actually, I wish we did. I mean, um, we had lots of aha moments uh, as we worked, but I mean, we have a very collaborative way of doing things. So as we would learn something new, it just kind of would disseminate through our team. I guess that makes, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess the short answer is no, but I think it uh, helps me editorialize that we use a fairly effective uh, Agile Scrum uh, model. So when we build things, we build them together. One of the reasons that uh, we wanted to use Moose is because we wanted, uh, you know, less Tim Toady uh, internal to our team. And uh, at first I was thinking, you know, maybe that's not a good thing to say, but one of the ways of Tim Toady is to not have more, not have Tim Toady at your particular organization. Uh, and we wanted one way to instantiate objects. We wanted one way to, um, uh, you know, handle accessors. We wanted, uh, you know, the one true way to do these things so that we could think about other things than whether we should be blessing a reference or cloning the reference that's passed in or parsing the hash or, oh, does it take a hash? We had a bigger problem to solve, and that problem wasn't about startup performance. It was about working together and being able to, uh, you know, have our code be clear rather than clever. Any other questions? Yes. Oh man, I thought about putting together some of this fan. See, I thought I was going to be like way over time. And then I talked really fast. I have plenty of things to talk about. We started from about zero. I think we're at about, I know that lines of code are kind of crummy as a thing, but we're about at 50,000 lines of code. We're, um, we've got an enormous number of tests now. Um, we uh, uh, use uh, Bamboo to automate the test of the suite. Um, whenever we commit to our development branch, it automatically kicks off the unit tests for our Moose stuff. So the reason I know about, you know, made such a big deal about the this timing of the Moose tests is that we run tests a lot. So, you know, when uh, Bamboo kicks off its test suite, if you've, uh, caused Bamboo to take 20 minutes to um, run the tests because you decided that you were going to add X number of files and X number of use cases, that immediately affected everybody. Um, the uh, number on the team averaged around five, and I've got about five minutes. Um, the number of the team uh, uh, averaged around five. The, uh, um, the interesting phenomenon that uh, uh, 
I sort of anecdotally found was true was that we sort of started out with one class that we wanted to attack. It was an invoice class. And I had heard that um, the, uh, um, uh, the measure of how good a piece of code is and you know, a file is, is how much that file is touched, how many times you have to fiddle with that file. Because if you have to fiddle with that file a lot, it's not done, or it's not properly abstracted, or it's doing too much. And so while my video might have been boring, uh, one of the things, if you look at it as much as I did, is that you notice is that as the code moves, you start to notice that the files at the core of those things aren't touched as much. So we sort of converged on very stable classes over time, and then towards the end, we're just adding functionality to an already working code base out in the periphery for the most part, an occasional bug fix. So about five on the team, rotated some, uh, and code that uh, if the company would allow me to show you something uh, that it won't allow me to show you, I would be proud to show any of you. Probably not. Probably not. Because I know too much now. If I were going to do it all over, I'd be doing it all over knowing, knowing Moose. So, uh, you know, it's, not, it's the same thing with, like, say, could you use Moo instead? You know, someone asked me, well, you know, could you make all your stuff run in Moo? And I said, um, I have no idea. Uh, it's like, why borrow trouble? You had a Honestly, um, and, and maybe this is just my experience or a snobbiness, uh, I would buy a good, good book, a hard book, a book where you open it up and go, what is going on on object-oriented design? I mean, that is the first thing that I would recommend. Um, because for most code bases I've worked on, and you know, I don't like to brag, but I've worked on lots of different code bases with different levels of OO. Moose is more sophisticated than any other OO uh, mechanism I've seen in Perl ever. And so if you're not solid on your OO concepts, then uh, you're used to the OO features that your company decided, or your project, decided to implement uh, at the time that they were implementing it, because they had to build most of it themselves. Moose, you get it, it's a cornucopia. The people are learning the OO stuff as they're trying out features in Moose. Uh, so, you know, the first step would be to really remind people about OO when designing to interfaces before you start setting them loose to uh, start using all the delicious, delicious candy that comes with Moose. And then, I guess, the other part, make them read code. Make them read code. Writing it's easy, reading it's hard. Make them read it. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs>